Welcome to our conference call today, and thank you so much for joining us. And I particularly want to thank you for joining us on, on such a somber weekend. This has been so hard as we mourn the tragedy in Connecticut and, and, and understand that it's hard to, to move on and really appreciate your being with us and understanding along with us that the issues that we're working on are so very important um, as well, that this is, these, these issues are critical to our democracy, to the future of our democracy, to making sure that we get big money out of politics and that we make sure that voters get into the voting booth couldn't be um, more important issues. So we really appreciate your being um, with us today. As I've said on a number of occasions, and I should introduce myself, my name is Marge Baker. I'm Executive Vice President for Policy and Program at People for the American Way, and joined by my colleague from Public Citizen, Brian Eister, um, with whom we've been working on these issues for, for many, many years. Um, we, we are in the middle of a movement moment, and, and I think that's something that you all appreciate, and that we're in this moment because of all of your hard work and passion and energy and your willingness to commit many, many hours of your time and your passion to helping address the serious issues created by the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, as well as the increasing um, uh, panorama of efforts to suppress the vote, to prevent voters from getting to the polls and exercising their constitutional right to vote. So, Today, in a few moments, we're going to be hearing from one of my heroes and somebody who has committed his own energy and passion um, to working on these issues, um, Representative Keith Ellison, and we will go to him as soon as um, he's able, able to join us. Um, I, before we get started, I wanted to urge you to keep your phones on mute so that everybody can hear. And as we're waiting for Representative Ellison to um, get set up to join us, I wanted to turn this over to Brian, who can talk a little bit about kind of the agenda for the House parties that you all are planning to do today and give you some, some pointers. So again, welcome to, um, to this call. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I'll turn it over to Brian, and in a few moments we will also be hearing from Representative Ellison. Thank you very much, Marge. And what Marge said is absolutely right. We are in a movement moment. People are organizing in hundreds of cities and towns all throughout the country. As, as many of you know, we've seen more than 350 city council resolutions passed, 2 million petition signatures. That's one for every 155 Americans. And now 11 states are formally on board calling for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. Uh, ballot initiatives in November in Montana, Colorado, San Francisco, Chicago, three cities in Oregon, and, and dozens of other cities passed with average margins of about 75%. So this is very exciting. We finally have what I think America's really been longing for for a long time, which is some agreement from people across the political spectrum about what we can do to improve our country and improve our democracy and really create a better world for everybody. So that being said, that brings us to the present moment. Uh, we're organizing a national day of actions uh, around January 19th. Some of you will be planning actions on January 17th uh, because you do have targets which are better to um, bring a message to on weekdays, and, and many of you will be doing it on the 19th. So I'm going to talk very briefly about ideas, about what you could discuss today. But of course, this is your show, and you please feel free to organize your action the way we want to. These are suggestions. Um, so, uh, first you want to decide well, what sort of action you want to do. Now, some folks are going to do a rally, others are going to do a petition drive, others will do street theater or a teach-in. Uh, but one thing I want to say about this uh, very briefly is that it's a mistake to think that you need 500 people for a rally to be tremendously effective. We had rallies uh, in many small towns and, and big cities last year and rallies of even a couple dozen people made the front page of the newspaper, and activists were just amazed by this, and, it, and that really brought the issue to a, lo a lot of people's attention, got them to wonder, well, why do my neighbors care enough about this to go out and march in the cold and, and really start to learn about it, and it, it, it accomplished just a great deal. 
So actually performing a rally where you go out with signs and chant and speak your heart about your love for democracy is a very effective tactic and you really don't need a great many people for that to make a big splash. You can also have a teaching and in a public location educate people about this issue and about democracy and about why this is so important for everybody um, and for future generations as well. Um, if, if, if you want to do something very modest, you can do a petition drive and, and set up a table and educate the public and have conversations with folks and really help to spread the word that way. Um, and many people are engaging in street theater and there are a lot of really wonderful ideas that have already been performed about street theater. Uh, last year many folks had what were called funerals for democracy, but with an optimistic twist where late, uh, in, in Tacoma, for example, they did a whole theatrical presentation in the streets about reviving Lady Liberty and saving her from um, the, the influence of, of corporate interests. Um, it was really tremendous and there are a lot of really wonderful creative ideas you can come up with. People actually did a, a detective skit last year, for example, where they uh, went to a corporation and said, well, we're here we're here investigating a corporation that's been impersonating a human being. You guys know anything about this? Um, so that's a, a few very good ideas. Um, if, if you haven't already, take a look at the sample agenda on the People for the American Way website, unitedforthepeople.org slash money out. And um, that is a great agenda that covers just about everything you want to cover. And with that, I'll briefly pass it back to March. Great. So this is it's my it's my extraordinary pleasure to introduce someone who's been a hero of mine for a number of years, who's very much with all of us in this movement moment. Um, Representative Keith Ellison from the fifth district of Minnesota. He is a true patriot. He is an energetic warrior for our democracy. He totally believes in the cause to ensure that we get the money out of politics and make sure that the voters get into the voting booth. He is the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, a founder of the uh, Consumer Justice Caucus in the House of Representatives. Uh, a he, prior to becoming representative, he was a community organizer and a civil rights lawyer. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Representative Keith Ellison. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I want to uh, definitely convey my appreciation for you all of giving me a moment in the meeting. I, can, uh, I can't hear anybody, so uh, I'm hoping that there's some way for me, for you all to signal to me if you have a question or something like that because because I don't have any way to, to hear you right now. Um, but I, I just want to start out by saying that the moment that we're in is full of possibility. And part of that part part of that possibility that we have at hand is the ability to change democracy. And that means attacking Citizens United. Now, just because statistics show that citizens across the nation believe that money should have a lesser role in politics, and just because we have huge numbers of, uh, of public officials who agree that Citizens United should be overturned, doesn't mean it will be overturned. What it's going to take is concerted, organized action by everyday citizens on the ground and the organizing will have to take place at a person-by-person -person basis and uh, will have to be um, categorized, organized, people will have to be stay, uh, kept in touch with, and it will have to be like a real movement campaign. But you should know that our superior numbers will overcome their superior dollars. There's no doubt about that. That is the direction that this thing can go on, and uh, I believe that all this moment really needs is some people who really care and are willing to commit. Now, I'm encouraged by the moment we're in, and I just want to point a few reasons out why. We just came off of what I think has been a pretty successful 
successful election season. People, despite misgivings they may have had with the Obama administration, came together understanding that somebody was going to be elected president. Uh, and we had one or two choices, you know, by the time the primary in season ended. And that the president had ushered in and helped lead the process for financial reform, health care reform, credit card reform, and a host of other things, including Lilly led by equal pay. But even if you go down below the presidential le level, you can look at states like Colorado and Washington, in which people rejected the notion of a war on drugs, and in places like Minnesota, where for the first time we defeated a constitutional amendment to say that uh, marriage would be restricted to one man and one woman. But the, we also saw victories in places like uh, Maryland, uh, and other states across the Union uh, for marriage equality and essentially civil and human rights. So I believe we're in a moment where America's awareness is high. People understand that inequality is hurting the nation. People understand that we've got to raise taxes on the people who can best afford them and who this tax system has benefited the most. The American people are far ahead of politicians at this moment. But there's got to be some people who really are committed to going out there and like reaping the harvest and, and pulling people into a whole new uh, set of, of organizational relationships to help us overturn and defeat Citizens United. I want to say that there are people in high places who think that we're right. I was so pleased to hear Nancy Pelosi get up at a caucus meeting and say, we believe in DARE. We want to disclose. We have to um, amend the Constitution. We have to reform campaign finance reform. And then we have to elect people who believe in fair representative government and not government by, by the most money there. When Nancy got up and said that, I, I said, well, you know, we, we got the leadership in the place we need. Uh, John Larson, she appointed John Larson, who's the former chairman of our caucus, who's a uh, also a uh, Connecticut member of Congress, to, whose uh, job it is to help uh, the caucus enact DARE, you know? So, so whereas this, a lot of this, well, this whole notion of overturn Citizens United really started in the Progressive Caucus and by Progressive Caucus members. Now it's grown to be a caucus position, and this is definitely a welcome development. Of course, the Progressive Caucus, which I co-chair, will keep democracy in overturning Citizens United as a core function and value. But I just say these things because I think it's critically important to understand that the wind is at our back and that we are in a very important moment to expect success. You know, while there's some good things that happen, and I definitely believe in, in talking about what could happen, we also got to look at there are some pretty disturbing things that happen too. And these inform the public. The Chamber of Commerce spent $36 million in the 2012 elections. These people definitely want to keep things going their way. They like the idea of being able to dictate uh, the, 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 um, the political tempo. 17% of Americans' crossroads funding was from corporations. And uh, of course, you know, we know that, uh, that that there there are a group who want to have this uh that want to dictate the political tempo and make sure that uh, all of the political um changes that happen revolve around you know the money interest also sixty one uh large uh super PAC donors gave an average of about four point seven million now when when sixty one people can give an average of four point seven million what does that do to the average person's ability to affect an outcome? And of course, super PAC spending in 2012 was 640 million. So, uh, bottom line is, you know, we know we're up against some serious ugly, but we also need to be encouraged by the fact that so many positive developments are coming. I mean, just on the positive note, again, you know, the whole movement to hold it accountable and to make transparent the work of the American Legislative Exchange Council has been extremely effective. 
and they have, uh, you know, people are jumping off that ship by, by leaps and bounds. So we are at a moment in time when your efforts will be met with tremendous success, and the time is to seize the time. The moment, I mean, the thing is to seize that moment in time. And so I want to encourage you and let you know that you're operating on the highest ideals of our nation. You are uh, upholding the most important, most uh, uh, most ennobling values that animate this democracy by saying that an individual gets to decide the fate of our democracy, not somebody who has $4.7 million to throw around. And you need to be buoyed by the fact that what you're doing is right and will benefit not just you, but generations to come. Now, I just want to take you back a little bit. Take you back to 1973, I think it was, when a man who went on to become a Supreme Court, a, a Supreme Court justice, a man named Mr. Uh, Lewis Powell, ran for, um, not ran, but was appointed Supreme Court. But before he ever did that, he was a lawyer for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And <laughs> excuse me. And one of the things that uh, he uh, was asked to do is to write sort of a blueprint paper on how the corporate interests might uh, organize themselves so that they can reassert the interests of their economic class. And this document that he drafted is going on to be known as the Powell Manifesto. I'm sure many of you already know about it but many others of you who have it should read it. And in it, what he says is that in the university, in the shop floor, in neighborhoods, people are questioning, you know, our version of, of capitalism. And we can't tolerate this. And the way for us to reassert the interests of industry uh, and to make our viewpoint the dominant one is to put our money together endow some university chairs, but we know that there's this tradition of academic freedom, so we don't want to be stuck with that. We're going to start some think tanks of our own. We're going to put money there. We're going to go into the media so that we can tell our own story. And by making those very decisive moves back in the 1970s, what they literally have done is they have a whole network dedicated to their point of view, Fox News. But they also have the Heritage Foundation, Cato, American Enterprise Institute, and countless others. They've been able to create a body of, and I'll say it, quote unquote, intellectual product that uh, our, our, our ideas that we find very common today, such as that, uh, you know, uh, this, this place ought to be run more like a business. Uh, that uh, the idea that government is slow and inefficient and always does it in an inferior way to the cor than, than corporations do. The idea uh, that um, the corporate entity or the CEO is somehow the hero, making, you know, like folk heroes out of people like Lee Iacocca and others uh, others like, like that, as opposed to people who work in charity or nonprofit or who do noble works for, for out remuneration and pay. They went on to really kind of recreate our culture in a way and their biggest crowning victory was in the year 1980 when they elected uh, Mr. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who many people, you know, used to think is just sort of a just joke about Reagan and you know, how he was an actor. Well, he became the president. And even though the policies that he pursued looked like liberal policies today, at the time, they were devastating. He did destroy the uh, PATCO union, the, the air traffic controllers, and that set a, a in motion a whole, a whole wave of anti-union action that's reverberating till this very moment. Just take a look at Michigan. Much my point about bringing up Lewis Powell. My point is that the people who have given us the world that we live in, brought into its full manifestation by Citizens United, began putting the blocks in place while many people in the room today were in diapers or maybe even weren't around at all. And what I'm telling you is that if you want a world in which we have real democracy, where citizens vote counts for a vote, counts for a vote, and is superior in weight to somebody else's money, if you want a country where people can go to the doctor, can go get a quality education, 
can go to college in an affordable way, can develop their mind. We have a first world, um, uh, 21st century infrastructure that uses energy in an efficient way. And we live in harmony with the natural world in a, in a, in a, in a hold up uh, hold up environmental sustainability as a value to be pursued and, and held up and, 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 and sought for. If you want that world, you better start making that world now. You have to have the foresight, the energy, and the courage to plan for that beloved community now. And so one of the most important things you do, the most fundamental things you can do to bring such a society into existence would be to destroy Citizens United and to establish the citizen as the primary actor in this democracy, not the corporate entity or the rich individual. You know, sometimes you want to do something that, I mean, all the things that we do are important. You know, everything we do, whether it's passing gun control legislation or whatever, all this stuff is very important. But what I'm talking about is uh, real patriots, like in People for the United Way, doing something that is rudimentary and fundamental that will put our nation on the democratic trajectory for 40, 50, 60 years. We got to think ahead. We can never afford to be beleaguered. And we who are going to offer leadership to the people have to always uh, be of good cheer and be optimistic and work with each other in a cooperative way and look to solve disputes in a cooperative and constructive manner. This is what leadership is all about. And those of you who are taking your Saturday to focus on and concentrate on how to improve the quality of democracy in America, I think our patriots, I think deserve our undying support. And I just wish the best for you and hope that you will be tremendously and widely successful in all that you do. Thank you so much. Your words are so absolutely inspiring and we appreciate your taking uh, the time out of your busy schedule to address the group of activists who are who are in their homes on the Saturday afternoon planning their National Day of Action events on January 19th or thereabouts. One, one question um, I, I have, and then I think Brian might have a question, but one question I have is if you could speak a little bit to the other side of the equation. We know we have tremendous issues around getting big money out of politics, but the other side of the question in terms of dealing with the voter suppression that we know is happening around the country and where you all had a very successful effort over the, in, in this last cycle. Well, let me just tell you, you know, um, years ago I used to hear people make comments like, well, it doesn't matter if you vote. Um, anybody who's ever expressed that sentiment, uh, I'd only like to turn to them and show them massive effort to suppress the vote in the 2012 election. Because clearly, you know, the Koch brothers think it matters if you vote. <laughs> they wouldn't be breaking their necks to make sure you don't vote if, uh, if it didn't matter that you voted. Uh, but let me just tell you this, you know, the way that we defeated the, uh, the, the, the voter suppression in our state of Minnesota, I think is a remarkable story. Um, there is a uh, woman by the name of Mary Kiffmeyer. And Mary Kiffmeyer was the Secretary of State at one time, and that means she was our top election official. She was a consistent vote suppressor. She always used her discretionary latitude to restrict, deny, and undermine the, the vote. But yet, Minnesota's voting laws were so progressive, she still couldn't really stop it. Our, our voting laws allow for vouching for a person's identity. We have same-day voter registration. We don't have early voting, although we're working on it now, but we did allow folks to vote absentee, and you could just go down to the city council and vote absentee in prior to the election, which many people did. So we uh, were able to say that we had some of the largest voter turnout in the country and we're regularly up around the 77, 76 range. Anyway, Mary Kiffmeyer loses her election as Secretary of State, and then she goes on to become uh, a member of the Minnesota State Senate. Well, she is an active member of ALEC, and she began to introduce these um, 
photo ID bills as soon as she could. And uh, she passed one through the House and the Senate when the Republicans were in the majority. But we were lucky enough to have Governor Dayton in office and Governor Mark Dayton vetoed her bill. Minnesota law says, however, that you can um, you can uh, you can get if you pass something through the House and the Senate, you can put it on the constitutional you can put it on the ballot as a constitutional amendment, and that is what they did. And so when they first polled this, it was running at 83% approval, meaning that if people voted back when this thing was first put on the ballot by the legislature, it would have won with 83%. Mary Kiffmeyer was in the news being quoted as saying it was a quote-unquote slam dunk. Of course, at the same time, simultaneous to all this stuff happening with the state legislature last, last year, you know, I had a series of meetings in my office going on, but so did the legal women voters. And we said, we don't care what the numbers are. We're going to fight it. We don't care. We just don't care. Now, I will tell you that there were many friends, and I say the word friends because they are friends and I love them all, who told me it's not a good use of our money or time to try to beat this thing because it's just too popular and we can't beat it and we should just figure out whether maybe we can have a court challenge or something else because we cannot beat this. So why waste the time? Why waste the money? And I said, I, I don't care who, who fights it. We're going to fight it at the Ellison campaign. And the League of Women Voters felt the same way. And then a group called Take Action Minnesota felt the same way. So we all just started attacking this thing. We set out having a whole series of day of actions. We had a community meeting that the take action, had a week of action they established, and we just started trying stuff. We just started talking to the public. Well, lo and behold, our efforts bore fruit. And I will give a lot of credit to the Democratic legislators because even though it was clearly going to pass because they, the Republicans were in the majority, Democratic legislators in the State House making such an awful fuss turned it into a news item that was reported and they kind of helped spark the opposition as well. Well, days went by. We kept on speaking against it. We kept on sending out tweets, Facebook ads, community meetings, coffee clutches. We were going to senior centers, and we just and, and, and people started all on their own making up buttons. And so that's why we had all this non-uniformity when it came to our our um, our swag because people just took initiative. And you know what ended up happening is that sometime mid summer the first vote came, the first poll came out and said it was at fifty six percent. We all threw our hands up, and I'm gonna tell you, I knew we were gonna win. Now I didn't care whether we were winning or not. I was my campaign was dedicated to fighting this thing, but we I knew we then we were gonna win. We weren't just fighting a good fight; we were gonna win. Uh, Representative Ellison, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, we have a, a question in from Los Angeles. Uh, they're, they're wondering there if you've gotten any support for the amendment strategy amongst conservatives and Republicans, and if so, how did you do that? We, we did get some support among some, some Republicans. We had a former governor named Arnie Carlson. He was never popular among most Republicans because he was always sort of a moderate centrist. But he... Uh, is a true fiscal conservative, and when the numbers came out that this thing was going to cost millions and millions of dollars, and we were going to have to retool our entire election system, uh, he he was immediately against it. Now these uh, ideological conservatives, they didn't like him um, uh, criticizing this this uh, this, uh, this this initiative for photo ID. But he said, look, if you look at the expense, if you look at the fact that we don't have the money, if you look at the confusion. It's just a bad idea. And so he and, Ernie, uh, and Mark Dayton, uh, in the last few weeks of the campaign, did some joint appearances in some TV ads, which were very effective. In fact, we got, as I said, we got it down to about 56% in midsummer. We hung in the 50s. And then uh, we ended up, uh, you know, uh, not sure whether we were going to do it or not. And then in the last few days, the polls were coming in around 48%. Uh, for this thing uh, to to lose, uh, be, be, and, and so yeah, we got some support that way. So don't leave. What's the lesson? Don't leave any friends 
on the table. Get everything you can and don't quibble about why they support you as long as they do. Great, thank you. We've got uh, another question here um, asking, how do you counter the argument that an amendment to Citizens United hinders free speech and the, the First Amendment? Well, I say uh, overwhelming people with money hinders free speech. I mean, it's the most ridiculous argument. I mean, this argument that it hinders free speech hinges on the very erroneous idea that money in politics does not have a corrosive effect. I mean, when you see the words that, uh, I think, who, who wrote that? Was that Kennedy who wrote, the, wrote that in the opinion? Uh, that, that just seemed to me the most incredibly naive thing I ever saw in a Supreme Court opinion. No, it does not do anything. I mean, I mean, free speech is in no way unhindered by telling somebody that they cannot use, raid the corporate coffers uh, the, uh, to, to push their point of view out. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. All Citizens United really says is that the CEO can raid the corporate treasury to push his or her own point of view out. That violates not only freedom of speech, but also shareholder rights. <laughs> Uh, we've got another question here. Uh, so there, there are these events on the weekend of January 19th, and, and folks want to know what should the, the action be uh, afterward? What, what should people be asking the, the activists and the attendees of the rallies to do regarding I think they should be. I think they should have a number of things. One, I think people need to, we need to have people who declare their opposition to Citizens United, and I think that you know we're only limited by imagination of the participants. One, we should get massive letters to members of Congress saying, you know, overturn Citizens United. We have at least 14 pieces of legislation to get that done. We also uh, should ask people to go to their own city councils, school boards, state legislatures to get them to support the overturn of Citizens United. We also. Uh, ought to have just some basic teaching so people can understand what Citizens United is. But then we shouldn't stop at Citizens United. We should we should have people call and say we need to pass the Disclose Act, which means that corporate um, that, will, that all this money should be disclosed as to who's actually behind it. And then we also need to have folks demand that um, that uh, that we have real campaign finance reform. But, the, but, what, but what we ultimately need is to pass a constitutional amendment. So I think that efforts do need to be pointed in that direction. We have an immediate need to at least make them disclose to where the money is coming from. There's a, there's a, there's a piece of legislation right now authored by Chris Van Hollen and, and many, many others, and we need support for that as well. But, you know, don't let some congressman tell you, you know, what you need to be doing. Think of it yourself. I'm telling you, we are going to win this thing based on creativity. Now, I want to bring you back to when this young woman, uh, ba barely, barely a young woman, I think the young lady was probably like 18 or 19 years old, and she learned that her bank was going to charge her $5 to hold on to a debit account. She said she wasn't paying it, went up on Facebook and said no. Now, some people would say, well, some little 19-year-old girl is not going to stop Citibank or, or Bank of America from from charging her five dollars for for a bank card, but what she didn't know, or what they didn't know, is that literally thousands of people agreed with her. So, you now who told her she could do that? Nobody. What I'm saying is creativity is a key asset for us here, and we should maximize it. Great, thank you. Uh, for the sake of time, I, I imagine this will be the last question. Uh, how do uh, it's apparent that there's there's going to be MLK parades on, on that weekend? And people want to know if they can tag along, and how do they, in general, unite voting rights issues with money and politics issues? Well, I think the, I, I, the, I think the, the link is obviously made. I don't think it's a stretch at all. Here's what I would do. I would say you want to go to those folks who are planning king marches right now, and you want to start influencing them and telling them, let's make King's Day really mean something in 2013. Let's not just have some tired old march where we march, you know, to the Capitol or, or to the City Hall or wherever. Let's not have some good speeches about, you know, how we're going to live the dream. Let's talk about what King was really talking about, which is making America a democratic country 
And whereas racial segregation was threatening democracy in his day, money in politics was threatening democracy in this day, and just make the link. But start linking with people now. You don't want to surprise people and show up. I mean, if you, if you don't prepare, by all means, show up at the, at the march carrying your sign, say, get money out. But maybe you can even get the cooperation of the King Day celebrants if you start trying to engage them right now. And if they don't want to work with you, then do your own thing. That's that. Remember I said that thing about creativity? That is vitally important. And as long as what you're doing is in the spirit of what we're doing, I don't think that anybody in a leadership role should try to suppress other people's creativity if it's getting the message across. Going back to our voter suppression thing that we defeated in Minnesota, man, we had so many different buttons all saying one thing, vote no. And we had different colors, different letter shapes. Look, be creative to get money out. Congressman Elton, thank you so much for your time. We're going to pass it back to the D.C. office. And Let thank me you say thank much. you to everybody. And thank you, Marge. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to everybody on the call. Bless you guys. I know you're going to be real successful. We're going to do our thing here in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Ellison. Um, what better charge for the moment? Uh, urgency of now, the importance of planning, the importance of creativity. So thank you all for joining us. And plan your Plan your events and let us know in any way that we can be helpful. We'd be, we're, we're more than happy to, and we can't thank you enough for all that you're doing. Brian? And uh, just briefly, we, uh, we have people for the American Way and Public Citizen are here to support you every step of the way. Amendment at PSAW.org or amendment at citizen.org with any questions at all we can help you out with. And I want to reiterate on United for the people.org, that's the number four, slash money out. There is a agenda of some things that would be very effective to go through at today's house party. I really want to thank you all. As Keith Ellison said, generations from now, we'll be able to look back and know that we really did something tremendous and historic to make a better world for our children and our grandchildren and everybody beyond. So thank you all so much. Thank you all. Have a good day.